Good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. And welcome to another webinar to celebrate 50 years of community development block grants and Section 108 projects. I'm Paul Webster, the director of the team that manages the CDBG Loan Guarantee Program, which we refer to colloquially as Section 108. Thank you for joining what is the third webinar in a four-part series. I hope you were able to join the previous presentations on using CDBG funding to advance community development objectives in rural communities and how CDBG funding can be a powerful resource to help communities, large and small, build resilience and aid their recovery from natural disasters. Next slide. Today's agenda, uh, we're going to learn about some amazing economic development projects from across the country. These were job creators in their respective communities, and we'll learn how these four communities use their funds for these exciting projects. We will hear how each of these unique projects use community development block grant funds and or Section 108 loan guarantee funding to address pressing economic development needs in their communities. Time allows, we will have a brief open conversation with our guests today. So please leave any questions you have in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. That's okay. Next slide. So again, this is a special year. We're celebrating 50 years of CDBG. I am a walking, uh, living history of, of the CDBG program because I joined HUD in 1972, two years before the Housing and Community Development Act was uh, signed into law. And I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to work on the eight categorical programs that were consolidated into the CDBG program. Each of these categorical programs focused on one project category, such as urban renewal, public infrastructure, et cetera. So the law was passed and I provided a timeline of some uh, milestones, particularly related to economic development. In 1974, Congress enacted the Housing and Community Development Act that was signed into law by President Gerald Ford. Uh, in 1977, there were some amendments to the, uh, to the HCD Act, primarily to address some shortcomings insofar as the loan guarantee mechanism uh, under Section 108 is concerned. So, what it did in 1977 was to remove some uh, onerous requirements related to using uh, Section 108 and replaced those requirements with a very simple one, which involved the pledge of CDBG funds as security. In 1981, uh, Congress enacted the, uh, the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act the main feature of that act was to create the state CDBG program, because heretofore, uh, between the enactment of the program in 1974 and 1981, HUD administered the CDBG program in non-entitlement areas. And over the next several years, um, there were a series of uh, laws passed uh, that uh, made changes to the program, uh, including uh, in 1983, uh, changing the overall or creating an overall benefit requirement, which was not there before, such that at least 51% of all CDBG funds would have to be used for activities that benefited low and moderate income persons. Section 108 was amended to require grantee to obtain financing from the program only if it's made efforts to obtain financing without the use of the guarantee. In 1987, uh, the law was changed again to raise the overall benefit requirement 
to 60%, and Housing Rehabilitation and Economic Development Activity were added to the list of activities that could be carried out under Section 108. In 1990, the, the law was changed uh, by the Cranston Gonzalez Act to, uh, among other things, uh, create the home program, but it also uh, raised the overall benefit requirement for CDBG to 70%, which is where it stands today. Uh, it modified Section 108 eligibility to allow HUD to guarantee uh, loans on behalf of non-entitlement communities. It created a 20-year repayment period and added a split of 70-30 uh, for 108 between entitlement and non-entitlement areas. In 1994, uh, the law was amended to add a provision to Section 108, which uh, added uh, the ability for HUD to make grants in conjunction with Section 108 loan guarantees, such as the Brownfields Economic Development Initiative grants. And then in 2009, the law was changed to uh, to add or to allow states to apply directly for loan guarantees, which heretofore they had not been able to. Next slide. So I'd like to introduce you to the panel today, to the speakers. Uh, we'll begin with, uh, with uh, Sherry Howard, who is the uh, uh, deputy director uh, of the Housing and uh, Economic Development Department for Palm Beach County. As Deputy Director, Ser Sherry has been involved in managing the county's efforts to promote business and affordable workforce housing development opp opportunities through public-private partnerships. With 29 years experience in county government service, Sherry served personally as the county's Economic Development Director prior to merging with the Housing Department. She also served as the county's legislative coordinator, advocating legislation with federal, state, and local officials, and as Assistant Scripps uh, Program Manager, served, serving as liaison between the Board of County Commissioners, the Governor's Office, Scripps personnel, and the public. Her work has earned her two Golden Palm Awards, which represents the county administrator's highest level of recognition for employee achievement. Sherry serves on numerous federal, state, and local housing and economic development committees. Speaking to us from uh, on uh, projects uh, carried out in Anaheim is Grace Ruiz Stepter. She is the Director of the Housing and Community Development Department in Anaheim. Uh, Grace has served over 20, has over 28 years ex of experience managing various housing and community development programs. Currently, she holds the dual role of Director of Housing and Community Development for the City of Anaheim and Executive Director of the Anaheim Housing Authority. Her, her responsibilities include overseeing all affordable housing development programs for Anaheim, including the Housing Choice Voucher Program, which provides rental subsidies to over 6,800 in Anaheim. She has responsibility for the, workshop, the Workforce Development Program and federal entitlement programs, including CDBG, uh, Emergency S Solutions Grant, ESG, and the Home Investment Partnership Program. Under her leadership, the Anaheim Housing Authority has produced over 500 new units of affordable housing in the past five years, and is on track to produce another five to 800 units in the next five years. From Birmingham, we have Dr. Megan Venable Thomas. Uh, Megan is currently serving as the Director of Community Development for the City of Birmingham. She is deeply committed to fostering a thriving environment where all communities can prosper, drawing from over 15 years of military service and a wealth of academic accomplishments. 
Megan brings a unique blend of expertise to her role. With a doctorate in public health from Harvard University, Megan's background is firmly rooted in addressing health disparities within the built environment. Prior to her current position, Megan served as a senior program director at Enterprise Community Partners, where she provided invaluable support to community development organizations nationwide. Megan's academic journey includes a master's degree in public health management from Columbia University and a bachelor's degree from the University from the United States Military Academy. Ellen Fillo is the Director of Community Development in Newburgh, New York. This fellow is the Director of Community Development for the City of Newburgh. She has been with the City of Newburgh for 10 years. Her responsibilities include managing the City of Newburgh HUD programs, including CDBG and CDBG CV. This fellow has also uh, has, has experience managing other federal, state, and local grants. She has a background in both public and private sector industry with experience in project management, product management, and program development. She holds a bachelor and master's degree. So, it's quite a good panel, if I may say so. And I don't know about you, but I'm eager to hear about their projects uh, in uh, their communities. So if we can begin with the next first presentation by Sherry for Palm Beach County, Florida. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul, and good afternoon, everyone. This presentation is going to focus on the key features of Palm Beach County Section 108 loan program. But before we start, I wanted to just offer some parameters of Palm Beach County for those that are not familiar. It's comprised of 1,971 square miles with 47 miles of shoreline. And Eastern Palm Beach County is very um, urban, while the central and western uh, portions are, are, are very rural areas. When people think of Palm Beach County, many don't realize that agriculture is among our top industries, um, along with tourism and construction. And we lead the nation in the production of sugar and sweet corn, and sugarcane covers some 400 acres or about one third of our overall land mass. Currently, we have an unemployment rate of 3.3%. The average wage is $74,800. The median price of a home is $650,000, while the average price of a home is $1.1 million. So like many places, we are not, uh, the wages are not keeping pace with the cost of living. So if we can go to the, uh, yeah, perfect. Um, thank you. So before we start to talk about our CDBG programs, I wanted to talk about some of our um, other programs that we use to leverage. Um, we have our revolving loan programs, which include the USDA IRP loans. And these are for our rural areas that are designated by USDA. Um, and we use a fixed rate of 3% with maximum loan amounts of 150,000. We also have a Department of Energy loan for energy efficiency improvements to businesses, also with a 3% interest rate and a maximum loan amount of $150,000. Next slide. For our non-revolving loan programs, they include an environmental protection brownfield loan that is utilized for brownfield cleanup by private developers for commercial or housing development. And we leverage these loans with um, brownfield assessment grants that we apply for on a regular basis. For CDBG-based programs, we have a small pot of funds for microloan programs available for, um, and also our HUD 108 loan program that provides gap financing. These can be used in our unincorporated areas or our incorporated areas. Next slide. We also utilize CDBG for economic development services through private partners. Services they provide include technical assistance for smaller startup businesses, incubator space, loan guarantees, and credit builder loans. In accordance with CDBG, each partner is also required to create jobs. 
Next slide. The key features of the 108 loan program that offer value to our businesses include access to funding that provides gap financing that a traditional lender can't provide, long-term financing at lower rates and longer terms than conventional financing, and the program ass assists in distressed areas contributing to economic revitalization. Next slide. So what can you use these funds for, the Section 108 loan funds? Just about everything, real estate acquisition, construction or renovation, purchase and installation of equipment, and working capital. So these are some of the, the loan program requirements that we utilize. The company should have been in business for two years. The, uh, we set the loan uh, to value ratio. We have the debt coverage ratio. We ensure sufficient collateral coverage and the borrower must provide personal guarantees. If the loan is being provided to a business in a CDBG entitlement community, they must provide a match to the Section 108 loan. And we require a loan application of $1,000. Prior to investing a significant amount of time to a project, we want to know that the loan applicant is, is, is serious about this program. Next slide. Thank you. Once we have had our initial meetings, a checklist is sent to the applicant so that we can further determine eligibility. This reflects items included in the checklist. For example, their business plan, tax returns, personal and business, a credit report, appraisals, et cetera. Our program criteria, which is approved by HUD, is modeled under SBA's underwriting guidelines. This also assists us when an SBA loan is included in the capital stack. Next slide. So this is one of the first and the largest projects that we've ever uh, provided a loan to. Oxygen Development is a cosmetic manufacturer that you may not have heard of, but many of you either use or know of their products. They manufacture cosmetic formulas for hundreds of products you find either in a drugstore or department store, varying in price range from very affordable to higher end products. Then they label the products and ship them to the company for distribution. Section 108 funding and the amount of 5.9 million went towards the construction of a 200,000 square foot build manufacturing building. The total project cost was 23 million. And you can see here the capital stack for the project. And this is typical for us and you'll see that moving forward. The bank, the SBA, our 108 loan, and then the required owner's equity. Um, the total project cost was 23 million. They were required to create 400 jobs for the loan from us. And so far they've created over 1200 jobs. Next slide. This is a more typical loan that we provide. Our average loan amount is about $250,000. The capital stack here closely reflects the sources in the previous loan for this $1.7 million project. They utilized 108 funding for their line of credit, utilized partially for the acquisition of the building and other costs such as marketing and payroll. Next slide. This commercial kitchen project is nearing construction completion scheduled for October of 2024, and it's, it's really exciting. These loans were provided for machinery equipment and working capital. The KISS kitchen section of it will provide 16 small spaces for lease for either food prep or for retail. This is a small businesses that are not you know, ready to move into a space on their own or they can't afford a building space on their own so they can lease a more affordable space. And these are approximately 400 square feet each. Florida Canning will provide equipment rental that has the ability to can or bottle and pack goods. And Oceana Coffee will have a coffee roasting area and a retail space. This is a reflection of a great partnership that we have with CRAs, and in this case, the Lake Park CRA. They contributed $1 million to the project that is being dis dispersed in tranches to the developers. This $10 million project will result in 56 jobs. 
So here are some of the history of our Section 108 loan pro program. We've been approved thus far from HUD for $45.9 million, not all at once. I think we applied about seven times. And as we paid back those loans and we were eligible to apply for more, we did. Um, we have provided $32.2 million to businesses to date. We just received the additional $14 million um, over the last couple of years. Um, we have so we have 13.7 still available, although we have a number of projects in the pipeline that we're working on. The total capital uh, investment from these businesses is $145 million. Uh, the leveraging ratio uh, for every dollar of 108, $3.5 million was contributed from other funding. We've approved 55 loans to date for HUD Section 108. So far, 36 or 64 percent have been repaid, and the number of minority businesses that received loans are 41 or 75 percent, and we've created over 2,200 jobs. We've seen businesses that are either struggling to grow or flourish, or we that have struggled to grow, flourish, and expand beyond any predictions that we or they could have had. And you know, our success couldn't have been realized with the assistance that HUD provides us. And of course, with the talented team that we have here um, and with their underwriting skills. So thank you. And with that, I will turn it back over to Paul. Okay, I was muted. Palm Beach County uh, is a great example of, uh, and their use of Section 108 funds is a great example of how uh, our loan fund concept works. They get a, uh, a total commitment, say, of $10 million, and they use that to originate individual loans. Each one stands on its own. Uh, that way, they don't have to come back uh, to HUD every time they have a new loan. Uh, and uh, it works uh, uh, most efficiently that way. So now I'd like to turn uh, the uh, program over to Grace uh, Ruiz Stepter uh, for the City of Anaheim's project. Grace? Yes, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to present um, in this um, very special event tonight commemorating such a wonderful anniversary of a, a program that has really provided uh, quite a depth of, um, of economic activity in our city. Can I get the next slide, please? Um, a little bit of, of background on the city of Anaheim. We were incorporated in 19, I'm sorry, 1876. Uh, we are the um, largest city in the County of Orange. Um, we are located in California. Um, Orange County borders um, are March, are March our much larger sister county, which is um, Los Angeles, uh, California. We are, that is our, our neighboring court and we are the, we are at the, the furthermost tip. So we border Los Angeles. Um, so, but we are pr primarily, I think as an initially envisioned uh, more suburban with a, a large agricultural background. Our annual population is uh, roughly uh, hitting about 340,000. We have about 200,000 businesses um, and over 25 million visitors. Um, and that large number is largely attributed to the fact that we are also the home of, the, of Disneyland. Um, and so we have quite a bit of uh, visitor uh, activity into our area, um, which makes us, which makes one of our largest industries, uh, really the hospitality industry. Uh, the median household income for our area currently is about 85K. And I was struck by Ellen's comments about uh, the median uh, price of a home in her area being about a million dollars because that is what it is in our area as well. Um, making it, making housing, uh, housing one of our, our biggest challenges among other, among other things. Next slide. So our Section 8108 uh, borrowing uh, th for this particular presentation, um, we took a, we started on a journey to request a Section 8 borrowing really around uh, 2008. Um, it really was, we have a, a pretty robust community input process um, through which um, 
community services uh, chairs express to us really what's going on in their neighborhoods and help provide the the pathway in terms of how we itemize what it is that's you know where we should invest our CDBG dollars. Um, often over the period of many years, um, the projects that were ending up on those priority lists um, required much more investment than a one year allocation, um, which you know then allowed us to really start to think bigger in terms of like, well, maybe the section 810, the section 108 loan is really the vehicle for us. Uh, and this is, uh, this particular borrowing is Anaheim's second journey into um, a section 108 borrowing. The first one was um, to uh, take over and revitalize a large uh, or county um, dump site that is, is a in a prime area of our city. Um, so this particular um, Section 108 borrowing was for a number of things. It included our Anaheim um, Family Justice Center, uh, which is, a, it was an acquisition of a building. That building was primarily a service center for those exiting abuse situations, uh, senior abuse, domestic violence, those things, uh, things of that nature. And they were a one-stop shop for anybody um, really looking to um, um, get out of those situations, nonprofits, uh, immediate, you know, quick housing with uh, resources there. We did our Mariloma Park Community Center, um, which is uh, helping with facilitating a community center in, an, uh, in a low mod area where it was um, basically a service desert. We took on the Thornton Brady Storm Drain Project. This is a neighborhood in Anaheim that had for many, many years complained about that even the slightest bit of rain would uh, cause significant damage to their neighborhood. And then we put, took on the Anaheim Packing District um, under the national objective of removal of slum and blight. Um, so combined, our um, Section 108 loan ask was for $15 million. And as the slide depicts, we itemized how and where um, the money would be spent. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation, we will be focusing on the Anaheim Packing District. Next, please. So these are some of the renderings from our um, our packing house, uh, now newly renovated. Um, so as indicated, our we were awarded um, a, a fifteen million dollars uh, loan. Um, the city will we pay uh, will we pay that loan over a twenty uh, year period as required by program re requirements. Um, for the portion of the loan that's funding that's funding the Anaheim uh, Packing District, um, the city actually entered into a co-op agreement with our former Anaheim Redevelopment Agency to begin that first phase of the process. And our redevelopment agency is actually pledged to um, help repay the portion of this of the 108 loan that was attributed to the packing house uh, because uh, it it is now uh, a major economic driver and it was always anticipated to be so of uh, what we financed with our loan was uh, a lot of the, it was really the improvements uh, surrounding the building infrastructure, adjacent streets and curves, because the city had previously uh, purchased the building in, in 2000. Next, please. So the evolution of our packing district. Um, as the oldest city in Orange County and one of the largest city in California, we, we have a, a really a rich city really rooted in agriculture. However, around the 1970s or so, um, the forefathers of the cities engaging in revitalization efforts actually demolished about 100 acres of our downtown area. And uh, that created quite a community outcry around um, a sense of wanting to really preserve some of Anaheim's di uh, historical uh, buildings. And at the time we had two packing houses. Uh, one unfortunately burned down in a fire, leaving the one uh, that you see now in this rendering to be the one that remained. Um, so through a series of community charrettes uh, and, you know, a lot of participation for a city, the city council, um, we landed an, on an idea of what it would be. It wasn't always thought to be a food hall, but that is what it is today. Next one, please. Next slide, please. 
So um, the Anaheim Packing District is about 50,000 uh, 50, square feet, which is inclusive of the Packing District at the south end of, our, of the Packard area. Um, the district now offers uh, a mix of indoor and outdoor experiences, very unique um, in that um, these are not uh, credit type tenants. It really is a series of small entrepreneurs. So while we bought the building as a slum and blight area and we've engaged in historical preservation and in, in an effort to really address the community outcry to save our historic buildings. It has served as many other things. It's an economic engine. It has brought many, many people to our downtown area. It has basically really invigorated what happens in our downtown area. Um, if you ever happen to be in Anaheim, the packing house is on Anaheim Boulevard, and we uh, we've worked hard to make sure that you know it can so that if you're, you're you're not going to Disneyland, there's something else other than just our downtown that than our our main re resort area. Next slide, please. So the departments uh, who was involved in making this happen, obviously um, the the Section 108 loan from HUD was critical. Um, we happened to, at the time, also in, in enjoy some pretty re robust uh, resources from the Anaheim Rede Redevelopment Agency, which as previously mentioned, was really who had purchased the property and was engaging in a multitude of other activities around our downtown area, including uh, bringing in more home ownership opportunities, infusing in some um, affordable housing opportunities. So it really was um, a much larger effort to just revitalize our downtown area. Um, but we, we had this asset in the packing house that we just, uh, at the time, were a little challenged as to what to do with it. And this particular rendering, you will see two stories uh, up and down, but the when we when we owned it and before it was uh, fully rehabbed, it was really uh, two big thick concrete slabs separating the, the top from the bottom. So it wasn't this uh, nice open air type of concept at the time. So we did apply for the section 108 loan uh, in 2000, uh, late to the mid 2000 uh, uh, under got our award notice uh, in about 2009 because we were already engaged in uh, revitalization efforts at, in the downtown area uh, we were able to lean into into developers and construction companies that had been previously built using a lot of using all of the requirements of CDBG um, to help us do all the infrastructure, all the outside street improvements and, and what have you. So we weren't we were able to pretty much hit the ground running um, and construction started pretty quickly on those uh, public improvements in 2010. Um, we we simultaneously were working with um, through with redevelopment funds on the interior of the packing house, and completion of the of the structure really finished around uh, 2013. Um, simultaneously with tenant lease up and a grand opening happening in in uh, January of 2024. Um, it's important to um, probably highlight that this vision was really made possible through through this community charrettes that really said, we want a public serving special something for us um, and the engagement of some really creative architecture and construction companies. Um, the designer of the packing house is this is um, the Little American Business, um, which has a campus in Costa Mesa, California. And their uh, business model is really all about uh, bring uh, providing space for micro businesses, um, businesses that really uh, are, are non traditional, are looking to grow and have something special to offer. Next, please. So, we were able to find some historical uh, photos of what the packing house looked uh, like when it was an active orange packing house. <laughs> uh, next one, please. This is what it looks like now. Um, it is um, quite an asset for our downtown area, um, a favorite um, selfie uh, spot for a, a lot of uh, multi-generations. Uh, music is provided here on the weekends. Every type of um, local uh, 
type of food, you know, out from Mexican to, uh, to Indian to Vietnamese. There's a speakeasy in here. So it's become uh, quite, uh, quite the gathering space, not only for Anaheim residents, but really the broader, the broader Orange County area. Next, a few more photos. <laughs> These are cute. Okay, with that, I will uh, conclude my presentation. Thank you. So thank you, uh, thank you, Grace. That was a uh, very interesting project. Um, I would uh, now like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Megan Venable Thomas, from the city of Birmingham. Megan? Thank you, Paul, um, and thank you for having us to talk about little old Birmingham. Um, so uh, we're excited. A little, we're going to give you a little bit of background about Birmingham um, and why the HUD 108 is such an important tool for us. Um, but I first want to just talk a little bit about um, our population, which is around 200,000 in the central hub um, of the greater per, uh, Birmingham region. But the overall population of the greater Birmingham region is about 1.1 million, which makes it the largest population and economic region in the state of Alabama. Uh, we have a median age about 35.7 with a median household income of about 32,000. The median property value is about a hundred thousand. So, uh, if you're out in Cali and looking for some places that you might be more affordable, Birmingham is here for you. Um, our home ownership rate, though, is about forty six point four percent. And so, a lot of people know a lot of uh, think they know a lot about Birmingham and typically think of civil rights, which is an important part of our history and who our residents are. Um, but there are also some other really fun facts that I just want to share before we hop in. Um, it's also known as the founding city for the recognition of Veterans Day and hosts the nation's largest um, and oldest Veterans Day celebration. We're also the only place in the world where all the ingredients for making iron ore are present in the soil. So coal, iron ore, and limestone all within a 10 mile radius, which is why we're called the magic city because we created that industrial magic overnight and the city was built. Um, also the Vulcan, which is the mythical god of metalworking is the largest cast iron statue in the world and is second in size only to the Statue of Liberty. And it sits in our Red, Mo Red Mountain area here in Birmingham. And the Vulcan statue's bare buttocks facing the suburb of Homeward measures as wide as the Greyhound bus. So if you ever come visit, there's a lot to see here in Birmingham, that being one of the, one of the attractions. Um, so here in Birmingham, we just um, seeded our $26 million loan pool that we were able to begin to, to originate on um, loans on, on our own last year. So we really are beginning to leverage this tool um, in, a, in a greater capacity. So it's exciting to see from our other um, fellow development departments how they're able to and have been able to leverage that for over um, a very long time. Uh, but we're going to talk today about one of those projects uh, that's in a community called Inslee, which is a very historic neighborhood in the, in the, the city of Birmingham. It was founded in um, 18, 8, 1887. It became part of Birmingham in 1910, and it was a flourishing working class community that mirrored the growth of the U.S. steel because downtown Inslee was able to model that neighborhood district and had all those components in the soil to begin to build up the industry. Um, but by 1960, approximately 45,000 people called this home, representing over 13 percent of Birmingham's population. But in uh, when the U.S. Steel began cutting back in the mid-1970s, and in less than 10 years, the site was shut down completely. And because of that and other factors that we all know about and probably have heard about across our city, um, despite the continued presence of strong community leadership and dedicated core businesses, Inslee began to decline. Today, Inslee is home to about 4,500 people, one-tenth of its former population, and only about 2% of the total number of re residents in Birmingham. And so our city and our mayor has had a real vision for how we revitalize the Inslee neighborhood because of its importance, not only to the city, but I think to the Southeast region. Um, and so we really are thinking about how we bring back 
different components of the Inslee community through growing quality jobs. At one time, U.S. Steel's Inslee, uh, Inslee employed a combined 34,000 people, over 10,000 more jobs than the University of Alabama accounts for today. And so it's a really critical component to think about how we invest in Inslee. So I'm going to talk about the in Inland Seafood Project and how we leverage our HUD 108 for that. Next slide, please. So the Inland Seafood Project sits in the Inslee neighborhood, um, and it supports, again, how we're trying to think about a number of factors that our city is focused on, from investing in Inslee as a job hub for logistics, some supporting small businesses, catalyzing investment in commercial and retail development, and developing civic capacity in young people. Next slide, please. So Inland Seafood actually was based out of Atlanta. It's one of the largest seafood distributors in the Southeast and has a really innovative model for how they support companies across the Southeast region. It's been here for 45 plus years, providing quality products um, and service to customers. And they really supply over 5,500 restaurants, 2,500 retail outlet, outlets with um, wholesale gourmet foods, and seafood. And so when they became interested in wanting to open a branch here in Birmingham locally, um, amongst a number of other products at, and programs, we were very excited to want to support as the city to think about what that could look like, uh, particularly for the Inslee neighborhood, as you'll see in a moment, a lot of what they were wanting to offer was at the intersection of a lot of the goals that we were trying to see in the Inslee community. Next slide, please. Um, and, you know, when we think about the importance of not only what people are trying to bring, I think a little bit of what Grace was talking about, but also what their, um, what their mission is and how that mission really aligns with the vision that community has for themselves. Um, and so uh, this Inland Seafood already talked about the passion that they have and the commitment to bringing service community involvement and quality to any place that they arrive. And that really aligned with not only what the city wanted to see, but what the residents were hoping for in their community. Next slide, please. So um, a bit more about Inland Seafood, uh, sustainability, quality, and community were really those three tenants. And we thought that when we we're thinking about how we want to leverage HUD 108, it's not just about uh, what they can produce that obviously aligns with requirements of the HUD 108, which you heard a lot about earlier, but also how that then aligns with the vision that your community has for itself, this, what the city wants for itself, and how, how they can really meet the two where they are. Next slide, please. So some of the services that they were interested in providing and ultimately what we enacted through this HUD 108 program was we utilized this um, $2 million, which you'll see, I think, in the next slide, uh, the breakdown, but to purchase equipment, to pay off mortgages, to enhance facilities, to add jobs, train employees. Um, they did job fairs uh, to be able to engage not just uh, folks from across the Southeast, but also to get local folks engaged and involved and think about hiring and workforce development. Uh, they did research and product development sales and marketing. And one of the things that we were really excited about was they created a culinary training center. So not only were they doing their normal um, uh, product delivery, but this allowed them to expand into other spaces that our community wanted to see. So not only were they um, doing what they do, but they wanted to be able to train people around food service production, around the culinary experience, which really here in Birmingham, if you've never been, we have a number of beard awarded restaurants. It really is a hub for um, food, for the food scene, quality food scene in the Southeast region. And this really aligned in a beautiful way here, um, as well as working with local schools on food education programs. And so again, when we thought about what our goals were and their goals were, how those aligned were really critically important. And so uh, if you go to the next slide, we'll see a little bit more about the breakdown. Um, so they had a uh, 2 million in HUD 108, also um, about 2,000 
750 in CDBG, which le was leveraged in a few different ways. Um, but they also brought business investment of about 4.27 million, along with seeding, again, with those local schools and local work workforce development um, organizations, were able to then bring a lot more of impact based on that small smaller on the larger side, but smaller investment um, really was able to create more investment. And so for people, they have, I think, are up at 246 um, jobs currently uh, with who they're employing, um, starting from zero jobs because they were moving into our area to creating 46 jobs, um, to really being able to come into the place uh, create new businesses here, not only their old own business, but being able to invest in other workforce development opportunities. So now youth um, are that are excited about culinary opportunities moving into the culinary space, um, as well as job training for other uh, folks in the Inslee community that are now moving into the logistics production space. So ultimately, being able to grow, again, quality jobs was really critically important to us and to the community. Investing in Inslee as a job hub for logistics, so being able to bring that um, expertise around logistics and operations that um, they were not only doing their work, but then training other people on how to do it. Supporting a small business, so we were supporting the small business to grow even their footprint across the Southeast uh, being able to catalyze investment in commercial and retail development, which was critically important in their expansion, and then ultimately being able to develop the capacity of young people in the Inslee community. And so again, we are always excited to be able to share some of the things that are happening in Birmingham um, and to be able to continue now that we are um, servicing our own loan pool to be able to continue to grow more local opportunities through our HUD 108 program. So thank you. That's a photo of, <laughs> of uh, some of the, um, the training, the work culinary training program. Okay, well, thank you, Megan. <clears throat> that great to overview of the project and the description of my hometown, Birmingham. Thank you very much. Uh, so now I'd like to turn uh, the presentation over to our final panelist, Ellen Fillo, with a description of the project undertaken in the city of Newburgh, uh, but not with Section 108, but with other CDBG funds. Ellen? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, thank you. I'm so happy to be able to participate in this panel and um, present with the other presenters and um, to talk to you a little bit today about a really great opportunity we've been able to provide to our city of Newburgh residents uh, related to an on-the-job training workforce development program and using our dollars a little differently through our CDBG program. I don't know if you want to go to the, the next slide. So we're going to start off with a little bit of a uh, fun fact and let you know where the city of Newburgh is located. So city of Newburgh is located about 60 miles north of the city. And for anyone outside of the tri-state area, that is uh, New York City. Um, we uh, are a small, densely populated city of about 28,000, almost 29,000 people, and a surf uh, surface area of about 3.8 uh, square miles. Um, the fun fact is that we are the birth, birthplace of I Love Lucy. So if you come here, you can see uh, the theater where Lucy and Desi got their start. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to, to talk a little bit about is in the programs and you, know, you go through your, your annual action plan and you receive your comments and your feedback and then your elected officials um, frequently will say we want to provide uh, good job opportunities or opportunities for good paying jobs for our city residents. And we also want to reduce those barriers to unemployment. And um, so about eight years ago, uh, seven years ago, uh, it was like, okay, these are our comments. Keep this in the back of your head. See what opportunities can come along. So I'm going to move to the next slide and let you know what happened. Um, 
So, uh, oh, actually, we're going to talk a little bit about a program design. So the, the jobs, uh, the, the, the program design includes, we wanted to have something that had uh, higher uh, job wage opportunities um, in Orange County. We're located in Orange County, New York. Um, we wanted to be above what's considered that living wage, which is about $26 an hour. We also wanted to have a program that uh, provided careers and not just jobs, but careers for low skilled or no skilled employees. Uh, and then we also wanted to remove those barriers to employment. Um, and some of those barriers, which I'm sure that you have all experienced are transportation and childcare. And we've also uncovered a couple of other barriers uh, as we've rolled out this program. So we're gonna move on to the next slide. Um, so we had a wonderful opportunity um, for us to partner with an industry that is based in the city of Newburgh, a company called Choice Films. Um, they are a film production company uh, located in the city of Newburgh, and they also um, manage and operate Umbra Sound Stages, which is, they have several stages in the city of Newburgh. Um, Choice Films, and speaking with them, uh, they were also looking to begin a production assistant, film production assistant training program. And what was driving their uh, need was they were finding that they were importing a lot of their, uh, their help from the West Coast or up from New York City. And that was eating into their uh, potential profits from the, the uh, tax credits that New York State provides uh, to film productions in Orange County, New York. So... With that, it was like, okay, let's see how we can support this. We can be beneficial to their program in providing the jobs uh, to our city of Newburgh residents, as well as uh, providing, uh, helping them where, you know, they can have their business flourish in the city of Newburgh. So we're going to go on to the next slide. Um, and so with that, uh, we have uh, a film training program called Below the Line Boot Camp, and that was born um, couple of years ago. And basically the, the film training program, it's dedicated to training underserved communities and the fundamentals of film production. Um, part of the unique uh, part of Below the Line Bootcamp um, is that the film production company also provides really great mentorship to the participants. You basically become part of their film family. So if you participate, they're going to help you find where it fits, you fit best into the film uh, business. So uh, again, what I'm going to do is move on to the next slide and talk a little bit more. So the participants in Below the Line Bootcamp had the opportunity to work in a number of production areas while they're going through the training. You could get experience working in the camera area, grip and electric, scenic, accounting, which is huge, which people don't understand about film productions. It's important. Hair and makeup. Um, how to identify locations. And as I mentioned earlier, some of the participants found they didn't like being uh, working in the set area, you know, the onset area it was a little too much. And, and below, uh, below the line boot camp through Choice Films, they were able to find them some post-production uh, work, which is really that work that's done maybe where there's not a lot of, of noise, it's done possibly at night, uh, where they are working more with um, the daily um, film capture for the next day. So with that, I'm gonna to go to the next slide. So I talked a little bit about, we had some challenges and um, just wanna talk a little bit about that. So one of the things, again, going to transportation, uh, and we've heard this with every job that has been here, people can't work because they can't get to where they need to go. What we found with Below the Line boot camp, uh, the some of our local residents, they were living a mile away from the soundstage and couldn't get there during the day. And they were using an Uber. Um, it was becoming, uh, not, they were not able to afford that. Um, and so some of them ended up dropping, dropping out of the program. Um, another one is childcare. Uh, we've heard that in numerous um, focus groups with other um, job training initiatives. And, um, and, and the final one that kind of ties into childcare or any type of, of care um, is uh, uh, the film shift. So a film shift could be about 10 hours, maybe 12 hours a day. And how do we make those, provide those accommodations to these city of Newburgh residents? We'll move on to the next slide. Uh, so some of our solutions have been 
um, is we provide through our CDBG program uh, for residents that, City of Newburgh residents that participate in the program, we're providing some stipends for transportation um, to make sure that those residents can keep working. Um, so either locally, whether it's a mile to that set or um, uh, sometimes they will also need to get to set. So that's another situation that has happened uh, where the production wasn't able to, to accommodate them. So we were trying to uh, do that through our CDBG program. Um, we've been talking to some local child care providers in the area about designing a program uh, for child care. Um, and uh, that's it's a little trickier, but we have someone in mind and she's able to, she's going to work with us to design the program so that uh, it'll be something where uh, participants will be able to have their children uh, watched while they are uh, working or doing this on the job training. And, um, and then again, adjusting the shifts for some of the workers who needed uh, to either do childcare or had other care responsibilities at home. And um, I'll talk about why that, that one could be a little detrimental where you're reducing your hours, but it's something that keeps everybody working. So we're gonna keep, we're gonna keep going uh, to the next slide. And uh, here's some pictures of some of our below the line bootcamp. Uh, participants and uh, some of the experiences that they've been able to receive. Um, one of the reasons uh, that uh, we, one of the things that we wanted to talk a little bit about too was the issue with the end point and the end goal of the below the line boot camp training is to get residents from a, a $15 an hour minimum wage job to get them above that $26 an hour uh, living wage in Orange County. And that endpoint is actually for those residents to join film unions. So we, we've had a couple of city of Newburgh residents join the film unions, but the, the number is not as high as we would have liked. And that's where we noticed some of the challenges were coming in. So the challenges were um, uh, some of the participants were eating up some of their costs with transportation, um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the production, about providing a stipend that can get people to be able to stick with the program for a little bit longer. Um, and um, so even though it takes a couple of, of, of hours, several hours for the residents to participate, uh, to join a union, they are accumulating hours while they're going through this training and constantly being mentored by our partner, uh, Below the Line Boot Camp and Choice Films. And um, I think that's all I had. I know I'm looking at our time. I think we're, we're winding down. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn this back over to our program moderators. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's open up our chat. I see we have a couple of things. Uh, and is anybody have any questions that you can would like to share with us? As a reminder to, to ask a question, you can select hosts and panelists from the drop down menu in the chat panel, enter your question in the message box provided and send. And this presentation will be made available on HUD Exchange. As of right now, there are no questions. Okay. So um, if um, if the audience doesn't have any questions, I have a couple of questions um, for uh, any of the panelists, really. Uh, how have your projects connected to your community's vision uh, to undertake transformational projects? Uh, And how would how would you uh, how would you define how the projects or how would you describe how the projects have uh, aligned with your community development uh, goals and objectives? Anyone? Sure, I'll 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 bite. <laughs> So, in terms of the packing house and the revitalization of the downtown area, I think um, uh, in the presentation, one of the things I think that was core is that um, 
the city forefathers had demolished quite, uh, like I said, over a hundred acres of the downtown area. Um, and so with a vision that something newer and broader would transform the city from an ar uh, um, primary agricultural center to more of a, a suburban urban core and, 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 and jobs would follow. Well, many of that many of that area remained vacant for some time. And folks that had lived here for many, many years started to really let the city know very vocally like that they valued the, his the history of the city and that they were really not pleased with the city that so much of the historical core had was gone. Um, and so what we sought to achieve with the packing house was really a, be, to be responsive to the community in terms of honoring their wishes that some of Anaheim's history be preserved. Um, this was uh, a, one of the, the largest, uh, the oldest packing house uh, in the in the area. You know, Orange County speaks to our agricultural uh, background. Uh, it was literally an orange packing house. Um, but we also wanted it to be uh, community serving, to provide something special for the downtown, competing with the fact that we also are a resort area and, you know, people know Anaheim for for Disneyland, but people who live here want something that's local, that's fresh, that's unique to us. So I think when you see the final outcomes of the packing house, you can see that we believe, you know, we achieved um, the packing house is on the National Historical Registry. Uh, it is definitely revitalized. It has really transformed our downtown area uh, from a lot of other investments. We now have local breweries that have come in and really invested their own money. It's not uncommon to see lines of people locally but outside of the area coming in to, um, to spend money here in Anaheim um, and in our downtown area. So now for those that live here, it, you know, we have something that is, 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 for our is for the Anaheim community. While we certainly love our resort and it is a major economic driver for us, we want it to have something local. So and it's also created an, a space for micro businesses for people to come in and test proof of concepts families to gather so I think from that perspective we, we were successful on many levels great thank you so Megan if I could ask you uh, I was intrigued by the efforts that are going on in the Inslee neighborhood can you elaborate a bit on what's going on there this is in Birmingham Yes, so we, um, as part of the Section 108, we had this Inland Seafood Project. However, we have a number of other developments that we've been working on, one of which is the rehab of a former um, elementary school. So one of the other consequences of the loss of the large industrial um, um, workforce in our community uh, was the closing down of schools because we lose the student body when we lose workforce um, again, which all has rippling effects to our neighborhoods and our community fabric. And so um, with our shuttered schools, we have a whole shuttered school program where we've been revitalizing um, shuttered schools, one of which is an Inslee High School, which we have plans for to do some mixed use opportunities on the site, um, as well as in a number of uh, the development, larger um, commercial developments that have been downtown. So we're excited about what is coming and happening in Inslee. We have a very active neighborhood and community association who provide a lot of feedback uh, for what they want to see. And again, a lot of the way that we do our work is really how do we align with the vision that community residents have for themselves with the resources that we have to bring and invest in opportunities that folks want to see. And I think I saw in the chat, too, that someone asked about using CDBG funds for grants, particularly for business communities. So one of the other things that we're doing, and it's in Ensley, is we use our CDBG for a facade improvement grants, um, as well as um, small business loans. So those are two kind of economic versus community, traditional community or housing development ways that you can leverage your CDBG funds to support businesses. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Paul, can I, yeah. can I add something? Sure. About our program? So what I wanted to mention was with our program, with our workforce training program, 
Um, I think it's important for people to, to, to understand too that when you have housing stability, we're also trying to provide that income stability. And that's where we're trying to move to have that work hand in hand. That if you have a, a job that uh, can pay above that, that living wage, and that can help with your, your housing stability as well too with those wages. And, and Paul, if I could just jump in on the CDBG, I mean, I think that, you know, uh, we have our microloan program that we use for CDBG, that we use CDBG for, but also with our economic development partners, it really fills the gap to help startups or very small businesses uh, to take off because it offers a number of technical assistance um, classes, um, also different types of loans, the credit builder loans. Um, so I think this has been a very valuable um, resource for us to send businesses to um, with respect to our CDBG loans. Yeah, great. Um, I have a question uh, about the transportation vouchers. Can I think the question was, can you provide more information on the transportation vouchers? Absolutely. So uh, the, the transportation vouchers actually run through our, our partner. We have a subrecipient agreement with uh, Below the Line Boot Camp, Choice Films, and they have several uh, program um, items that they can use uh, to implement the program. And so they'll set up that, that voucher. So we're not working directly with the participants. That funding comes uh, through the training, and then they work with, with the participants there. And then they they follow our procurement policy and also provide all of that uh, documentation to us for our reimbursement for the program. Mm -hmm. We've 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 had to to actually at one point, uh, due to New York State had had some some challenges with with I guess their uh, film office and the production actually had to move out of state to Connecticut and to North Jersey, and uh, that's that's really where a lot of this transportation. Uh, came uh, to the forefront when the the uh, the training program said to us, we, we need to figure out how to keep people moving. Can we use some of the dollars uh, to provide that transportation out to to uh, Connecticut and, and North Jersey? And that's when we started implementing that as well. And um, there was a question about, can some, any of you provide what you consider to be the best practices for undertaking economic development activities. Maybe Sherry, what do you look for when you're undertaking a, an economic development activity? What is the, uh, what is the one thing that you look to, to to make sure that this is something that uh, is not gonna come back to bite you? So, I mean, you know, economic development, the the fun thing about economic development is you can be a little bit more flexible and a little bit more creative. I mean, we set our underwriting uh, through SBA underwriting guidelines. So um, as I spoke about earlier in the presentation, we have certain ratios that they, they have to meet. We have certain collateral coverage that they have to meet. And, and sometimes we actually look for about 120% of, of collateral coverage. And I think the biggest thing that we do is that we really diversify our loan portfolio. So instead of putting all our eggs in one basket, we feel a little bit safer dividing it out through a number of businesses. So if something happened, you know, it wouldn't be as impactful to the county. Um, and then of course, setting up that reserve account to make sure that any funds that you do have that you can put in that reserve account, if there is any issues, helps to kind of, you know, get your back too. So those are the things that we, that we really look for to kind of help protect the county and the CDBG funds of the county. Okay. Well, we've got several comments uh, and uh, in the uh, in the chat box. Some of them are questions. Some of them are just uh, comments about uh, the presentations and and some of the. I, I hope. The presentations have provided the participants uh, some ideas uh, about how they can use the CDBG program. And remember, that include not only uh, the use of grant funds, but Section 108. 
to carry out uh, a wide range of projects, some of which uh, don't involve necessarily loan to business, uh, loan to grants directly to businesses. They oftentimes uh, uh, involve uh, large scale uh, infrastructure projects that are foundational to uh, additional uh, economic development occurring in the community. So uh, there are a wide range of, uh, of activities that can be undertaken that, uh, that have an economic development uh, result, but don't necessarily uh, involve what many people think of as economic development. Usually it's uh, giving money to a, to a business uh, to carry out a, a project. So um, uh, I think this wide range of activities, the, uh, the geographic diversity of the present of the projects and the presenters uh, indicate how uh, this, this program can be used to further uh, economic development and community development uh, and housing goals. Uh, housing uh, activities are often complementary to uh, economic development activities. So uh, we want uh, communities to consider how uh, Section 108, how the CDBG program can be used to carry out those kinds of activities that uh, address your needs, but also uh, meet a fundamental uh, national need these days, which is uh, uh, portable housing. So, uh, can I just, just tag on to your last comment? Because one of the, I was trying to give some examples of projects, but I didn't use a mixed use project. And that 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 goes directly to your comment to affordable housing because we do provide section 108 for mixed use projects and that retail component helps to support the affordable housing units in there so we've found that to be uh, very complementary uh, to the program thank you sorry <laughs> Great. yeah that's a good point so also remind you that um, that we published a proposed uh, rule proposed regulations back in January of this year uh, with a lot of uh, provisions directed towards making the CDBG program more uh, more useful uh, for economic development uh, funding. Uh, I can't get, it was still in the rulemaking process, so I can't get into any great detail on, uh, on what uh, the final rule will look like. But you can take a get a good hint from just looking at what we what we propose to be done. So um, we urge you all to, um, if you have any questions about Section 108, uh, we have a mailbox at Section 108 at hud.gov that you can get in, uh, that you can utilize. We uh, monitor that constantly, um, and even if the question doesn't necessarily relate to a 108 project. Um, uh, we will, uh, we, we are uh, an economic development team, so we can help uh, answer other questions that you might have on economic development or uh, housing type projects. Uh, mixed use housing is a big, is a big uh, area we hope to, uh, to, um, uh, to have that, uh, uh, you know, that clarified too. So, um, so with that, uh, I will turn it back to the meeting organizers and uh, wish you all uh, a great rest of the midday. Thank you. I just want to add the presentation will be uploaded to HUD Exchange. Great, thank you, Eric. Thanks, everyone. I think we can leave now. Thank you. And thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.